pandemic hit and we had to re-pivot and we were like, hey, we need to deploy this um, even more so now than we were before in our own backyard right now today because we've got a product that can keep people safe and secure and offer them an essential service, which is healthcare. Um, and, and be able to, to reach, uh, you know, reach doctors for, for uh, you know, uh, for care. Welcome to Startupville, the show where we discuss what it's like to build a tech startup and a startup ecosystem in a small city. I'm Mike Wolsfeld, our host is Dan Gold, and we're having conversations with tech leaders in our community about how they're working through the current global economic crisis and the larger implications on their sectors. Today, we're talking with Sean Hazen, founder and CEO of Lumica, a virtual healthcare startup based in Regina. In the face of the COVID crisis, Lumica made a bold pivot to alleviate strain on the healthcare system and provide people with safe and convenient access to care. We talked with Sean about how Lumica is playing a crucial role during the COVID crisis and how virtual healthcare can serve an important role in the overall healthcare system moving forward. We also talked about how they've built a solid foundation for their startup, assembling an impressive team of both healthcare professionals and seasoned tech veterans. Welcome to Startupville. Stay home, stay safe, and stay connected. Startupville is brought to you by Innovation Place and Martin Charlton Communications. Hello and welcome to this episode of Startupville. Sean Hazen is with me, the founder and CEO of Lumica Health. Sean, how are you? I'm doing good, guys. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. So let's start from the very beginning. Lumica Health, tell us what it is. Lumica Health, uh, yeah, it's a virtual healthcare platform that is connecting people uh, to doctors and, and doctors to people. Um, treat, diagnose, and, and prescribe, and, and right now more so than ever, you know, keeping people safe in their homes uh, while affording people uh, safe, simple, and, and secure uh, healthcare. So I'm, uh, we have, just to be totally clear with people, we have spoken previously, I have a background in med tech, and I find this fascinating. It's absolutely satisfying a need within our society if not our local communities what have you seen as a sign of change obviously covid-19 has has changed the game for people going and feeling comfortable at a uh, at a surgery let's say how does your product and service fit in in supporting the healthcare system yeah i mean one of the main purposes of you know the creation of Lumica was was one accessibility to healthcare, but secondly was to complement the existing healthcare systems, you know abroad. And what we've been seeing, um, you know, even locally here just in Saskatchewan, is the the de bottlenecking of the healthcare system and the pressure that you know was on them right from eight one one right you know during the onset of the pandemic, you know they were over overwhelmed uh, with calls, obviously. And, and we were able to alleviate that. We had, you know, thousands of new users and we were doing thousands of, of consults. And to do that, we're really kind of de-stressing the system. So we really see ourselves as part of the team in the whole ecosystem of the healthcare system and just working alongside the healthcare system. So um, that was our, our goal. And I think we've been uh, been able to achieve that. And, and we continue to, to work with the, the governments and, and local authorities to continue to provide a, best care uh, practice for for the citizens of, of, of the province. And as we, we're, we're in this digital age, we're in a space where we're used to ordering, you know, transportation by phone. We're used to ordering food through an app. We're used to getting this, that, and the other done through an app. Do you think that uh, the change in the adoption of this technology is as a result of people getting comfortable with it in different spaces. For example, the trust that came with people uh, with apps such as Uber Eats and uh, Skip the Dishes that they could trust that their information was safe. They could trust that their card details were safe. The products arrived. It worked. It was simple it was easy to use it wasn't a high barrier of entry and because they got comfortable with platforms such as those the willingness to adopt other platforms related to health for example has been easier for them yeah i mean i i, 
I believe the pandemic's obviously, you know, accelerated things. I think we're living, you know, in the future now in, in a lot of ways. Um, some we're ready for and some like it. Some weren't ready for it and don't like it. And some are just getting used to it and going with the flow. Um, I believe we've been accelerated by, you know, a few years due to this and, and you know, some good, some bad. And, uh, you know, what I've seen is virtual healthcare and other digital avenues have, are relatively new to a lot of people in, in different, uh, different demographics. Um, what it's done, what, what's COVID's done is it's almost, I don't want to say force, but the only option for people to see a doctor during, you know, this time has been through the virtual avenue and people who otherwise wouldn't have either trusted virtual healthcare, not knowing what it was, or didn't know how to access it. It was basically front and center now. And it was the only option to see their doctor to get a prescription. So what it allowed for our industry is I'll use force um, people to see it, use it, learn it and trust it a lot sooner and a lot faster. And what we've noticed is now these people are coming to us going, wow, this is amazing. Like I'm never going to the clinic again, just to get a refill for my prescription. Like it was so safe and simple and secure and convenient. I didn't have to drive or wait or, you know, the whole kind of, you know, the whole sales pitch of, of why virtual healthcare is so great and didn't have to wait in a, in a waiting room or anything. So now we're getting the stories of the people who were, I'll see naysayers or just didn't know about it and, and they love it. And so that's what we've really seen in terms of like a digital shift from what, what the pandemic has done in terms of accelerating, you know, where we are living today and also has obviously, you know, helped push virtual healthcare, which is, you know, a much, uh, much needed uh, essential service uh, in today's world. And the issue around adoption and trust must work in more than one direction. Uh, looking at it from the tech point of view, we're very comfortable with going to an app and using it and trying things, see if it works, here's our feedback. But how about the medical industry? When they looked at this, did what was the initial feedback when you had that first iteration, when you took it out to market and you said, hey, this is what we've got, take a look, could you be interested, what do you need? What was that process like and how long did it take to build that trust through uh, the evolution to where we are today? It's a rigorous process, Dan, um, not going to lie. We you know, have chief privacy officers and chief security officers. They work full time on this. It's not done. It's always improving and growing and expanding. Um, you know, we've got, you know, external, uh, third party auditors, uh, privacy impact assessments, threat, uh, threat risk assessments, um, all of those types of, uh, testing policies, procedures, protocol, breach protocols, um, it's a never ending thing. I mean, first thing a lot of people ask us, whether it's our physicians or our, our, our patients is how do you provide security and, and, and secure my data and where is it stored? And what does that mean to me? And so, you know, we need to have that stuff done and, and continuously, uh, continuously improving that system and that process. So the privacy and security is, you know, behind patient care, but like a very second close privacy and security and patient care are right here. And it's something that we work on every single day um, to ensure that we are exceeding uh, standard uh, industry uh, recommend, recommended practices. So. So you create the platform, you've got the space in which to do this, you've introduced the idea to practitioners and uh, the medical sector. The next step clearly had to be the attraction of, well, talent attraction, but the getting the clinicians on, clinicians on board to be able to support the system. What was that process like? Um. It was, it was good. I mean, we've had the, the digital savvy practitioners, uh, nurses and doctors, um, who knew about virtual healthcare and have used it or, or, or seen it or tried it or, um, read about it. Um, they were, they were eager to, to try it and, uh, you know, and we're, you know, very happy with it. Thanks buddy. Appreciate it. So I got my, my coffee here. Oh, no, I'm, I'm absolutely with you on that one. Carry on. <laughs> um, 
you know, and, and once they got in the platform and, and went through our onboarding process, we've got an onboarding process. I think that's one of the ways that we can attract them really well too, is, is one, our team is amazing. Um, and our, our system and our process is, is really, really well put together. So an onboarding program, um, and then a training program and orientation before they actually go live in the system. So, um, yeah, a lot of them ask for information right up front, and then we have that information. We've got the orientation packages, and then we check all the boxes, you know, with the privacy, the security, that, that, whole, that whole platform and that system. So um, the only thing that we were really cognizant about when we were recruiting uh, practitioners was that we weren't taking them out of their day job, especially during the pandemic when resources were already sparse. So we were, you know... The practitioners, the nurses and the doctors that we were able to onboard, and I'll talk about like kind of during pandemic mode here, were, you know, exceptional. Like these guys, you know, they are doing additional hours outside their day-to-day -day job and coming and serving with us to help others, um, you know, work in, you know, 12, 15, 18 hour days or whatever, you know, um, after their, their normal shift, they're, they're coming in and, and helping us, you know, help the, the, the greater good. So um but yeah recruiting you know it's easy when the, the the human capital is there um it can be tough when it's not there but um our practitioners here have been have been amazing uh to be accessible to us so on that the the caliber of the talent in the medical professionals is clearly very important but to be able to attract them you had to have a product which was going on the pathway towards success because you would have never attracted anyone. So let's just take this back even further. You're already a successful businessman with your your own organization. Why didn't you start Lumica Health as a part of that organization and leave it there? Why did you spin it out? And then as the second part of that, the talent that you attracted to drive the product forwards as its own entity. Yeah, so, you know, initially when, when we uh, conceptualized um, the product of what Lumica is and, and, and Breeze today, uh, we really were kind of building it as a tool to, to exist inside, you know, like you like you'd mentioned, my other company. Um, but it, it gained legs so fast, and, and right away I knew that this was much more than just a tool. And we're talking eight, nine years ago. Um, so quite ahead of the curve of, you know, digital healthcare and, 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 you know, the whole virtual healthcare space. So, um, basically di dissecting it out and, and then, you know, incorporating and creating Lumka Health, uh, as we know it today and, and building the team. Um, that was the other important thing, you know, I, I knew that we were going to have to have, you know, one of the most badass teams behind this thing to push this thing, um, because it's new, it's cutting edge where we're, you know, breaking boundaries a little bit and we've got some, you know, there's, there's some healthy competitors out there too that there's not a lot of them, but there's a number of them and it's growing, but you know, they're massive players in the space. And I knew we were going to have to have a, an amazing team. So we, you know, right out of the gate knew we'd have to have to build the best product and out service and out market and have the absolute best team and have those, like I had mentioned before, the policies and the procedures of the privacy and security and have a trusted product because you in healthcare, you only get really one shot at it. And so our biggest thing was building a trusted product that delivered safe, simple and secure healthcare, you know, to, to, to everybody. And you know, to keep it that simple, that's really what it was meant for. And I'm, I'm looking at your product. I, I, I see that its uh, popularity has obviously skyrocketed as a result of recent times and the situation that we are in. But People can't forget that this has an applicable base outside of a COVID-19 world when you're thinking of, you know, it, it, even just provincially. Obviously, you're looking geographically much further, but with people in remote communities. Uh, look, as a child, I would watch an Australian TV show called The Flying Doctors. And The Flying Doctor Service is obviously a real service in Australia. I used to love watching that. Guy Pearce was in it. Um, and it was uh, amazing seeing the doctors fly into these remote places to do what felt like really, really simple tasks, but they had to be on site. Now, 
uh, now, frankly, your product would ruin that TV show because a lot of what they could do could be done remotely. It's a great compliment to mean that they're only going into these locations when they absolutely have to, cutting down on uh, you know the the travel time, the response time, the the risks uh, uh, associated with the travel side of it, and a lot of the the primary care being delivered via the app itself. So it's very complementary. Um, when you looked nine years ago, I'm not saying that you were watching the Flying Doctors, but when you looked nine years ago and you saw that there was a need, was it beyond? servicing remote communities? What was the trigger where you went, it's not just this, it's that as well? Yeah, I mean, so in the industry, you know, in, in industrial construction, oil field and mining sectors that, you know, that it was, you know, kind of birthed in, um, they're people that power those industries. Um, I, right out of the gate, like, I'm, I want to include everybody um, in anything I'm doing. And right away I knew like, this is for everybody. And, you know, not just for industry people, but the healthcare workers, the, the daycare, the teachers, you know, every industry um, of any make is, this is for them. It's for people, it's for their health, it's for their wellness and for their, you know, quality of life. And right away it was, and so that was the, that was the catalyst that, right away I knew like this need to be dissected and created as a company and a new brand and a new team to drive this for everybody. And, and that was really kind of the, the, the driving force behind that is that it's not just for industry, like everyone can benefit. The, the industry's um, spouses and partners who are at home while these people are away for a month at a time, it's for them too. And so right away I knew I can't have this branded as an industrial company or thing. This has to be um, neutrally branded for everybody anywhere and, and it was as simple as that i look at what you're doing and i look at the sustainability of it and there's no doubt that this has legs when you look at the opportunities that are out there and there are opportunities we we, we look at the covid19 era and we go you know things are tough some companies produce the right thing at the right time and they happen to uh, hit that zeitgeist, whatever that moment is. Uh, this is a terrible time. We're seeing a lot of sad outcomes. But when you've got a product that can make a real difference to real people's lives, where do you draw the limit in terms of servicing a population? Do you go, let's do it really well here first, nail it, then we've got a case study to take to another market and another market. Or do you go, okay, we've got a footprint here. Let's get our talent out there showcasing it running now and look at those other markets. I remember when we spoke before, you were looking at not just Canadian um, uh, communities to be able to be out there to support. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we experienced, uh, we were, you know, going through a pivot um, and re-pivoted and kind of really had to focus. Um, when the pandemic hit, we had a tool that was ready. We, we had a tool that had already been being used for a year and we've had, you know, moderate success with it and it worked really well and it checked the boxes. And we were in the midst of pivoting to expand, as, as you'd said, into other regions and pandemic hit and we had to, Repivot, and we were like, "Hey, we need to deploy this um, even more so now than we were before in our own backyard right now today, because we've got a product that can keep people safe and secure, and offer them an essential service, which is healthcare, um, and, and be able to to reach uh, you know reach doctors for for uh, you know uh, for care." And so that's what we did, and our our development team, our, our administrative team, our healthcare teams. Uh, our executive and management teams, we, we all just, we were all hands on deck, all on board for a very long time, just like to obviously meet that, you know, spike in, in demand right away overnight. And, um, so that's really what we've done there. And now, you know, I can say it's not cooled off, but it's now we're managing it. Our processes have been in place. 
and, and we're just, we're, we're doing our thing now. Um, and it's not as frantic as it was for the first two weeks. Um, we're getting really good at what we're doing uh, in terms of servicing the people and the people are speaking for uh, on that for us. And, and we really appreciate those, those reach outs. Um, but now what we're doing is really wanting to streamline and make it more efficient for our practitioners and for our patients when they are in contact with us. So the conveniences, whether it's now, you know, adding in digital prescriptions right inside the application and a drop down where their pharmacy knows that they're, you know, this close to this pharmacy and it's just making the, the user experience and the other added features um, just a lot more streamlined and make that user experience so flawless that it gains us even more trust in the marketplace with our current patient base. Um, and right now we're, you know, like you said, kind of get your product going, do really good and expand. And, and so the other thing that we're doing now is we're really focusing on um, the family physician model now where we can actually connect patients with their family doctor specifically within the app and not just, um, I won't say not just a doctor, but with their family doctor where they know uh, their clinical history, their past medical history, you know, that whole, that relationship there, that continuity of care is super, super important in healthcare in, in your life. And, and, and we know that. And so now things like that are things that we're focusing on. And as we continue to mature our product and mature our platform, um, our user base goes up and we continue to expand outward now a little bit more slower, but more methodical um, in terms of what we're doing. So we're really pleased with, you know, with where, where we've, you know, where we were, where we're going and, and how we're getting there. So. And you mentioned uh, your team. You've got an organization where your team is already working remotely. You don't have a centralized base for this. Obviously, the impact hasn't significant. Well, maybe you could answer this. I'm making an assumption. Um, the what, what Was there any level of impact with your team where they're already working from home or their home offices, but now if they had children, the children weren't at school, they were suddenly in the environment, and maybe their partner, should they have one, is also in exactly the same airspace. Uh, was there an impact? I know there's a, a human impact when you spend so much time with people, even if you remotely like them or even love them. Um, just, um, so what is the impact to your organization when dynamics change within people's home offices they do um for us it's been um i'll start off with um the 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 biggest arm of uh, our team with the exception of the healthcare team being the dev team uh in terms of headcount um we've been super um uh, grateful and fortunate to have our dev team um, who actually have worked together for over a decade. Um, so when you talk with them and listen to them, um, it's not new for them to work virtually. They know each other. They trust each other. They know how they work. They, they, they all know each other's jobs. And so there's a sense of trust there that we've been really fortunate to be able to adopt during this time where everyone is basically forced to quarantine and work from home, if, if that's an option. So um, in that, in that sense, we weren't really affected because of the talent of our, our development team and the history they have together of working together. So very, very grateful to have been able to, you know, build a team like that within Lumica. Um, and, and that, you know, really um, just kind of shed over the, the rest of the team too. So we have a, a weekly catch up, uh, stand up on Mondays, and then we have a, a bi-weekly strategy meeting on Thursdays um, with a smaller team. And our, our, uh, our Monday calls, you know, everyone's on the call and it's, it's quite funny. You've got, you know, a number of people on there um, and we've got people from out of province and we've got people from all over the province um, on the call. And it's, uh, it hasn't, it hasn't really affected us a lot. Um, we've been really fortunate with a, I know, an amazing team, as I, I said before, and uh, just the, the cohesiveness of them working together. It was a bit different. I mean, now we, we've had 
two two births um, within, well, one really right in the pandemic, one just prior. Um, so we had newborn babies on calls. We've got, you know, um, and then you got three-year-olds and seven-year-olds fighting in the background. So the, the family dynamics there, but we're a family company and, you know, uh, we're a small company. We're a we're family company. So for us, we welcome it. It's fun. It's, it makes the calls, you know, interesting and, and humorous. So we enjoy it. This is the first time where I've done a tech interview. And someone has said, this is a family company. And it puts the humanity at the center of an organization. Very often we look at tech firms as, you know, shiny walls, ping pong tables, bean bags. Well, the bean bags are gone. You know, they're, they're not around anymore. But we, we don't often look at it from the pastoral care of of the CEO, the president, the board, and taking care of of the people of the company, because the company obviously is the organization, it is the people. Um I could spend I could spend hours talking to you. It's a fantastic uh, product. It's a fascinating time for anyone in this space right now. And to see that there is something that you've worked on to make a real measurable difference in people's lives is a fantastic thing to observe from my point of view. Sean, if people wanted to find out more information about you and the organization or to download the app, what, how could they do that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Dan. They, they, you know, lumica.com, L-U-M-E-C-A.com. Um, and right there, there's the links to the app as well. So we've made it super simple. So I mean, lumica.com and there's right on the webpage there, uh, links to the app and then under contact us, you can, you can get, uh, any of us there. So, um, keep it nice and simple for everyone. Sean Hazen, founder and CEO of Lumica Health. Thank you for joining us here on Startupville. Thanks guys. Appreciate your time very much. Startupville is brought to you by Innovation Place, helping grow the tech sector in Saskatchewan, Canada, and is produced in partnership with Martin Charlton Communications at WeTellYourStories.ca. The show is produced by me, Mike Wolsfeld, and our host, Dan Gold. Our theme music is from GG Riggs and Reactor Productions. Learn more about us and our guests at innovationplace.com slash startupville, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Startupville Pod. See you next time on Startupville.